Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I want to talk a little bit about some of the tools that you'll see me use on my channel as I am maintaining some of my tools here. As many of you may know, one of the, the, the regular features of my channel is disassembly and maintenance. Generally speaking, this is of uh, pocket knives, like this little guy, the pair of three lightweight here, um, because I am a firm believer that if you are going to carry good tools, you need to know how to take care of those tools, because if you take care of your tools, they'll take care of you. Um, but I also do things with watches and pens and otherwise, and I, I've got a nice little toolkit here that handles pretty much everything I need to throw at it in terms of these small tools and maintaining them. So I figured I would walk you through sort of a little bit of the process. Um, and one thing to note is that I've done this video a number of times before, but this is sort of the latest update talking about some of the things, the changes I've made, etc. Um, I guess one place that's a good place to start is with um, screwdrivers. So um, I have recently decided to move back to these guys right here. These are uh, drivers from iFixit. Um, this is a, a company that is really dedicated to electronics tools, um, but actually has a very good selection of tools that, that are useful outside of that domain. Each one of these is a little aluminum sort of driver here, um, and I've included in them a Weeha brand um, head here, and I've made three of them, and I had my wife color mark them with uh, nail polish, because I knew it would stay on there, um, such that I always know that this guy is T10, T8, T6, uh, in uh, the overall darkness of the color, giving me the size range there. Um, and so you'll see me using these screwdrivers a great deal, along with some other ones in there as well. In all the videos, you might actually see one of these three drivers. These two uh, here are from Scout Leather Company, and this guy is from Alexander Peshkov. Um, this guy is very, very hard to buy. He's got a new version of it, but it's crazy expensive, and these guys are crazy expensive as well. I use them for a long time. They work very well, but ultimately, because of the price, I can't really recommend them, and they're not going to stick around for me in my, uh, in my collection. Ultimately, I have a whole video on that. I'll probably link down in the description below. But anyways, you may see these guys in my older disassembly videos, but from here on out, I'm going to be sticking to the iFixit kit. However, sometimes as you are doing a disassembly, there are uh, screws that you just can't get at with this. Uh, whether because the, the, you're not using a Torx bit, um, although much in the pocket knife world is standardized around Torx, sometimes people can do that, and so as a result, I have to do some other things. I mean, to start with, I keep a variety of bits around. This is the bit set that I very often recommend to people. Um, this is a Weeha um, Micro Precision. I've got a whole Amazon link down below that shows you a, a store with all of these things in them, which, by the way, if you buy from there, you support the channel, but you're not required to. But anyways, this has a variety of bits from Flathead and Phillips Head, a bunch of Allen key bits, which are very useful. Many uh, many knives that don't use Torx use Allen key. Um, and then a good variety of Torx bits all the way up to T15, uh, which usually covers the, uh, the, 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 the gamut here. So if you just need one little kit, you can do it. And it even comes with this little driver and an extension. I don't like this little driver as much as I like this one, because this one is friction fit, where you really have to yank to pull these guys out of there, whereas these guys here are uh, magnetically fit, so you can pull the bits in and out much easier. But it's always good to have a good selection of these things around. The other thing that's important, though, sometimes is torque. Now, I want to be very clear about one thing. You should never be using a huge amount of torque when you're disassembling a small object. I mean, there, there, there are exceptions to that, but they're very, very rare. Generally speaking, if you are needing more torque, that means you're trying to turn something that's not supposed to be turned. But sometimes, due to thread locker, it does make sense to use a little bit more torque. And actually, to that end, I picked up this little guy here. This is another kit from Weeha, and it's actually more complete than that other one I showed you here. Um, but it includes, and it, it naturally it comes with one of those plastic drivers, but it includes this little guy right here, which you can use with any micro um, Torx bit, and gives you a whole bunch of torque on there, along with ratcheting, which is good because sometimes, especially with very sticky thread locker, you're having to do this over and over again, and it's it's nice to have that. So this gives me all the torque I need, um, at least in my estimation, uh, without a whole lot of struggle, um, and that's a beautiful thing. This little kit here is a bit more expensive, so it's not necessarily the first thing I recommend, but if you are looking just to do a bunch of this, as well as to have a bunch of your electronic style, like your penelobular screws for uh, your Apple products, you got all your various um, Allen key bits, all your various flatheads. Um, doesn't have a huge selection of Phillips, although it's got certainly some. Uh, this is another good kit that you might consider. But this is what I use when I'm needing a little bit more torque in my life. Um, and so in terms of disassembling things, those are really the main tools. A couple of other things, though, do come into play on occasion. This little guy is a pry tool. It's by, uh, it's the uh, Enigma Pocket Probe, and it's by RB Tools, or Rat Bastard Tools. 
I like this very much as a pry bar because, well, also it's a tweezer, but it's a good pry bar because it's nice and thick here. It's titanium. It's just well done. And so you'll see this show up a lot. I've also recently picked up a set of these little guys. These are uh, plastic spudges, basically that are not going to mar whatever finish you're in. So if you need to, for, for whatever reason, get in and try and discourage a couple of parts from being stuck together, this kind of thing is a nice little approach there. And so I'm going to be using those guys a little bit more in the future. Um, a couple of other things to note. I do have a separate one of these little guys. This is just another Torx handle. But very often on pocket knives, um, you will get what's called a free spinning pivot, uh, where the pivot spins freely. And this isn't, uh, you know, even threaded in there, but uh, come on, yeah. E10. But nevertheless, where well, you might actually need to secure the pivot from both sides in order to adequately turn the pivot there. Um, and so having a little driver like this that's kind of compact and very easy to manipulate with the other hand can make things a little bit easier. So I do keep this guy around for exactly that reason. So um, there you go. In terms of other disassembly tools, um, there, there, there were some other important details here. Um, one big thing, and by the way, this is just another bit set that you could choose if you just want another set of torques for your free spinning situations. And this has the advantage of being full size if you want, um, you know, full size screw uh, bits because you've got, you know, drivers you really like. So um, one of the things you will occasionally need are a pair of pliers as well as other little tools around there. And to this end, I keep my Leatherman Wave around. I love this tool. I've said this on many occasions, but the Leatherman Wave is really, in my estimation, the very, very best multi-tool that's out there right now. I'm always going to keep checking out more of them. But for me, the Wave just keeps on winning. And so having this guy close at hand is not only a great thing because it provides a nice, simple set of pliers here that I trust and know how to use well. Well, the ply is, it's not like, but uh, I'm familiar. We'll put it that way. Um, but it also gives me a couple of other tools nearby if I need something like that. So having this guy close by is always a beautiful thing for me. Um, and then finally, a pair of tweezers. And more specifically, you know, you can go to the freaking, you know, grocery store and buy a set of tweezers, but they tend to have like the flat angles there. And they don't tend to have a lot of grip to them. These guys are, I think, called uh, bandage scissors, dressing scissors. I'm not a surgeon, so I don't know why, you know, what they're actually called. But nevertheless, um, they are generally may, uh, used in the, the medical domain, and they're used to, uh, you know, pull out bandages and such like that. These have some nice gription in here, and they also have a very uh, thin edge, so on occasion you'll need to reach in and grip, uh, oh, for instance, a, a pin or a standoff or something like that in order to get it into position, and so having this nice narrow tip here makes it very easy to get in there and grab things, and also to move things around to position things more carefully. So these can be a very much a boon as you are doing your disassemblies uh, of pretty much any damn thing. Then finally on the disassembly front, uh, in terms of actual tools, I have a bunch of these guys. Now, these are watch spring bar tools. These are the cheapest ones of these ever. I actually ended up at one point in time buying an expensive $20 Burgeon version because I figured, well, you know, hey, maybe it's better. No, nope, it isn't. Um, These guys, they're soft metal. They're not going to be great. They're certainly not very good for, um, you know, removing links. I'll do a separate video on watch disassembly tools, I think. That'd be a good thing. But what these are super useful for is as an oiler. Not like Euler Euler's theorem, but as an oiler. So let's say that I, I have a liquid is something I want to apply to something. Let's say I want to take some of my thread locker here. This is Loctite 242, and I want to use the liquid thread locker, and I want to apply it to the inside of a hole. I want to apply it to the threads there. What I might actually do is take the, the Loctite and then put it onto this little guy here, put it onto the peg here, and that would actually allow me to go through, and if we pretend this is the screw I'm Loctite in here, I can just go through and I can do that on the inside of the, the, the threads there. And what that allows me to do is, well, spread the, 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 the Loctite in exactly the quantity, uh, quantity I want without the risk of, you know, pouring too much in there or anything like that. Because that's never a great thing. This also works very well with things like a grease, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit here. I, it's just, it's really nice to be able to put a little bit of a liquid or a potentially gelatinous, high viscosity, whatever you want to call it. Um, in exactly the place you want it, exactly when you want it. You'll also see me use this on occasion to like push out uh, a pivot or something like that, because I know it to be very soft metal. It is relatively compact. They're just really handy tools to have around. And for like three for five bucks or something like that, that you're getting these from, uh, you know, in the cheapy, uh, you know, Chinese brands, you know what? No freaking complaints there. They are a very, very nice tool. 
I'm just talking about Threadlocker. And Threadlocker is important. Um, I am using, generally speaking on the channel, I use this stuff here. This is Loctite Threadlocker on a stick. Um, it, it's called the medium strength version. You do not want ever to buy a uh, red Loctite or high strength Loctite or permanent Loctite. However, it's marked. I mean, some people have said Vibratite works a little bit better. That may well be. I haven't tried it. Um, I probably should. And why not? But um, I really like this stuff particularly because very often I'm dealing with relatively small screws. And so it's much easier to grab the screw and scoop a little bit onto the thread than it is to try and drip that on there. And I run the risk of, you know, dropping, you know, thread locker into something. And if you get thread locker in your bearings, it's just a bad situation generally. So I like the Loctite on a stick, but either one of these will work just fine. But you want to, again, make sure you are getting a removable, a medium or light strength thread locker rather than the high strength stuff, which may lock your knife shut in a really unpleasant way. I have a whole gripe about when manufacturers use it. So by God, you shouldn't use it either. Um, so that's one of the other important things, speaking of screws. Um, in terms of cleaning, actually, I tend to keep it very simple, although certainly I do have and I very, very rarely use uh, chemicals like Simple Green or even dish soap um, for doing serious cleaning. If something gets seriously grody, most of my disassembly cleaning is done with this stuff here. This is just 91% isopropyl alcohol bought at my local freaking grocery store. Uh, you can buy isopropanol a little cheaper, whatever. But either way, it is just rubbing alcohol. But the thing is, it does a very nice job of cleaning out oils and greases and whatnot like that. Um, it evaporates very nicely, which means I can, you know, if I uh, just be in the normal jackass I am, if I end up pouring some on my table, it will evaporate during the course of the day and they, 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 or, frankly during the course of the disassembly and I don't have to worry too much about it. So I just, I like isopropanol for this. This is a nice little detail. I'm sorry, a nice little compound and it's super freaking cheap. You have like two or three bucks or something to buy a bottle of it. That'll last you for six to eight months if you do as much disassembly as I do. Um, in terms of cleaning cloths. Some people have said, well, Nick, why don't you just use paper towels? And you know what? They work fine. If you're doing this rarely, I don't think you need to invest. But the thing is, um, with a paper towel, particularly once you get it wet, it starts to decompose. It starts to break apart. And so let's say if I've got this little guy here and I've got this very thick, uh, very strong texturing on this handle, I can do this over and over again. I am just dragging this against this very textured handle here and absolutely nothing is coming loose. You can see maybe there's a little bit of lint pulling up here, but it's not a problem. As opposed to with a paper towel or a napkin or any other kind of paper-based product, it's going to fall apart. And so as a result, I use these little guys. These are just swatches. Um, they're, they're, they're little they're fabric swatches. They're just some cotton or another on there. And you can buy them in huge packs. You can buy them in like a pack of a thousand for like 15 bucks or something like that. And the beautiful thing is that they don't fall apart. They don't leave, you know, little things of paper everywhere. And they're very, very effective at pulling out grease and gunk and things like that. And they're small enough that when I'm done with one, I can just throw it, throw it aside and get another one. And it's easy. I don't have to worry about washing them. I don't have to worry about, because there's all kinds of nasty chemicals. I don't want to throw them in my freaking hamper. Um, and so, you know, this is the reason why I'm using these little guys. I highly recommend it. This was something that I wasn't doing initially. I was just using paper towels, but then somebody said, hey, why don't you use like gun cleaning swatches? And that's, by the way, what these are sold for. But I buy them for knives and they work great. So that's a really nice thing. But it is still useful for you to have a, a microfiber cleaning cloth and even some kind of a soapy liquid here. This is an eyeglass cleaner, um, but at the same time, it's just soap and water, basically. And this is a microfiber cloth because, you know, those kinds of fabric swatches and rubbing alcohol aren't going to do so hot for, for instance, just cleaning up a blade, making it sparkle, making it polish. This may not be something that's ever relevant in your life, but for me, absolutely. If I've got a nice mirror finish, I want to be able to get that mirror finish up to the highest, you know, level of spoculation that I can possibly manage because I am a fancy, fancy man. And so you can see here now, oh yeah, we're much, much better at that. Um, and so having those things as an option is definitely a beautiful thing. Um, lubrication is the next thing to talk about. If you are disassembling or maintaining a pocket knife, you are going to want to lubricate some elements of it in all likelihood. There are some people who argue that, for instance, a knife that's running on bearings can be run fine, dry, and in fact, for some situations, that might be a good idea. If you are in an exceptionally dusty situation, any oil might capture that, but generally speaking, for my life, I find I prefer the action of these guys with a little bit of lubrication. And there were actually a couple of different kinds that I use. The main two that you'll see regularly uh, this little guy, this is Knife Pivot Lube, and this little guy right here, this is Nano Oil. So um, these guys are uh, from two different companies and have different strengths and weaknesses. 
Uh, knives that are uh, running on bearings, I really don't see all that much difference here. I get the impression, just kind of using it a little bit more off, that nano oil lasts a little bit longer. It stays in the pivot a little bit longer. It's just, it seems to be, so sometimes if there's something I don't really plan on shot, you know, maintaining for a while, I might use the nano oil 10 weight, and this is an important distinction there, um, but, you know, knife pivot lube works just as well, and it has the advantage of being cheaper, um, and definitely that can be a big deal, especially if you're not doing this all that often. It might not make sense to invest in a whole bunch of your, uh, your oil here. One area where knife pivot lube does have a decided advantage is on washer reaction knives. If you have a knife that is running on phosphor bronze washers, as this guy is right there, you 100% want to be using this. It's just a slightly different, I don't know if it's a slightly higher viscosity, a slightly better viscosity, or maybe just differences in chemicals, but this it runs, this makes for a much more satisfying uh, washer action than any of these nano oils here. And so that is something to keep in mind. One big advantage though that the nano oil family has is that it is a family. You have the 10 weight nano oil, which if you're just buying one for knife maintenance is probably the one to use. But you also have a much higher viscosity 85 weight nano oil, which is actually very good for knives. Uh, for instance, this is a, a sort of a back lock. It's the ant lock technically, but it functions a lot like a back lock in that you have this little piece that's going to be riding on the back of the, uh, it's riding along the tang of the blade all the time. And so that actually, you really do want a thicker lubricant um, on the back here. Same thing with other back locks like this Spydeco Delica here. It's a steel wheel tasso for what it's worth. Um, but anyways, having that thicker viscosity can be very nice there. Similarly, if you have something like an automatic knife where you don't necessarily need, uh, you know, crazy smoothness because, well, it's got a big spring. It's going to fly it open anyways. Um, this can be nice because it stays in one place for 100% sure. And then on the other side, you've got this guy. This is a five weight or CLP weight um, nano oil. This is very good for penetration. Um, what I mean by that is like, for instance, let's say the knife has been loctited shut by a manufacturer who hates you and doesn't want you to be happy. Um, one thing that you could potentially do is drop a little bit of this in there and it'll kind of work its way into nooks and crannies. I actually end up using this a lot as well for, um, you know, other situations where something just doesn't want to break free. Um, and so I like the five weight a lot for those specific circumstances. It's not necessarily my choice for just your everyday bearing knife, but it can be very good. Um, one of the things to note is that I use the 10 weight nano oil, or frankly the knife pivot lube, um, for uh, IKBS, or Icoma Corp bearing systems, loose bearing knives. Um, it's of sufficient viscosity to do that, but it provides a very fast action. Um, I, I like all of these guys. So in terms of, uh, you know, uh, lubrication, absolutely, you can't go wrong with either the 10 weight nano or the knife pivot lube. This guy is a little better for washes. This guy is a little better for long term. And then these guys have their specialist use but either one of these will serve you absolutely fine. If you don't want to go with a fancier oil like your nano oils or your knife pivot loop, another good option is this guy. This is Daiwa or Daiwa or something along those lines. Daiwa sounds like a, you know, oh God, I got a bad case of Daiwa. I got to stay home. Anyways, I digress. Um, This is a uh, real oil, not like as opposed to fake oil, but like for fishing, real oil. Um, and you know what? It works pretty well as well. Um, I think I prefer the action that you get out of the nano oil or the nice pivot lube, but if this is so substantially cheaper than either of those options for you, uh, it's a very, very small improvement uh, over uh, to go to the nano or the, uh, the KPL, that is. So both of those are absolutely solid. Another element of your uh, maintenance is going to be rust prevention. Oh, and by the way, I'm sorry, one other thing in the lubrication domain is grease. Um, you will occasionally see me use this stuff here. This is, um, it's nano grease. Uh, this is the, the, the fancy thing for it. Now, look, um, it works just fine as grease. Uh, I have no problems with it in terms of its greasitude. Um, it, it's absolutely fine. It does, however, smell like hell. Um, more specifically like boiled hell that was boiled in an old shoe. Um, it does not have the greatest of aromas to it. And as a result, um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of that, but there were, you know, this is the grease I have. It's the grease I use. If you have a lithium grease that you like better, by God, use it. But for the moment, I got this and I don't feel the need to, uh, you know, invest further. It works just fine, functionally speaking. And, you know, how often do you sit around smelling your pocket knife? I think that scent tends to go away. Um, but on the other side of this, this is just a contact lens case, by the way, that I use to capture high viscosity liquids and solids and whatnot like that. Um, on the other side here, I have uh, frog lube. Um, now, frog lube is not a good lubrication. They do have a liquid form, but that is a lie. You do not want to use frog lube ever as lubrication for a uh, pocket knife. It tends to gum up and get nasty and whatnot. But what it is very nice for, in my estimation, is a longer term.
from rust prevention. So let's say that you've got a knife where there are, uh, do I not have, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, you've got a knife here where there are uh, steel liners inside of the G10 scale. One thing I very often will do is put a little bit of lube on the inside of the steel where it's pressed up against the G, or a little bit of the frog lube, that is, uh, on the inside scale where it's pressed up against there. That that works very nicely for preventing corrosion over a longer term. Mind you, I've heard all kinds of things about, oh, it's just coconut oil and things like that, or oil of wintergreen or something. I mean, there are lots of theories about what this is. If you find something else that works better, then great. It's not a strong endorsement, but I, I have frog lube and I've used it and it works fine as long as you're not trying to lubricate something with it. The lube in the name is absolutely wrong. This is frog rust preventer. That's all you can think about it being. Um, one thing for the blade itself um, is this EDCI, a Aegis Solutions EDCI. Um, this was a brand that was around and then it died and then it was brought back by some prominent folks in the knife community. And you know what? I like it fine. It seems to work well. It, uh, it's very low viscosity. You have to reapply it on a pretty regular basis if you're, uh, especially if you're carrying in the freaking salt marshes, something that's not stainless, but it does work very well. A number of my viewers swear by it and I will often use it and apply a coat to it on a knife that's in like M4 or a D2 or something that's going to struggle if I put it away, you know, uh, unlubricated or on, uh, on CLP. So this is another nice thing, and uh, it, it is just a very, very nice uh, sort of detail. Mind you, it, do not ingest, uh, if swallowed, do not induce vomiting. So it's probably not the greatest thing to uh, use on something you're planning for food prep. If you're doing that, then I actually have some mineral oil around. I've uh, rebottled it, but still, um, I have some mineral oil around, and they, that that works fine as well. Just like the kind that you buy at the freaking grocery store is a laxative, um, you you can chug it for to, for that, and you know it has one negative effect, but that may be a positive. Anyways, I digress. Mineral oil works fine for that too, but it tends to also um, rub off very quickly, etc. So there you go. Um, oh, one other thing I should probably mention: a Q-tips, um, or whatever cotton swabs you like. They have you know fancier Q-tips. That have, you know, a, a kind of a sharp a point to them. You've seen these around on the channel. I bought some of these at one point. They're kind of nice, but honestly, they're not so much better than your generalized. And you can buy these for, you know, a, a bazillion of them at freaking Costco. And, you know, my wife and I both have a strategic Q-tip stash um, they're just around for these kinds of situations. For, you know, they're just they're handy little things to have, but they can definitely be helpful in getting in and cleaning spaces. Um, some other things that you'll see, oh, and then finally, uh, well, not finally at all, 22 minutes, good God, guys, sorry about that. Um, this is a Sharpie. So um, it's a good permanent marker. It's good for writing on things. Um, and the nice thing about it, too, is that you can write on something metal, and then it'll come right off with some rubbing alcohol. So I can say, hey, everybody... Let it dry, and then a few minutes later, I can come back, and I'll try and remember to do that. On the very least, I'll remember it next time I try to carry this knife. Um, but anyways, you can write on metal, and that can be helpful if you're trying to label parts, for instance, uh, which is a good idea, by the way, um, uh, especially if there are a lot of them. Um, but you can write on that and then uh, put it back up. The other big thing is that it's actually very helpful for dealing with lock stick. If you have a pocket knife, for instance, where, this, uh, where there's a little bit of stick when you try and disengage the lock, uh, it's mostly gone away on this guy, but I'll use it as an example. This is a compression lock, so the lockup surface is right here. If you can get in there with a Sharpie and just apply a little bit to that, in many cases, that will actually reduce or uh, in some cases actually remove that lock stick completely. Um, it's a little detail, but it can absolutely be very nice, and usually a couple of applications will make it go away completely. So um, I keep that Sharpie around, not only for marking on things, because that's, that's helpful, but also just for uh, use in that kind of thing. See, it's completely gone. And uh, we're back to our normal selves. So that can be a very nice trick. Um, a couple of other things you'll see me keeping around on a regular basis. A flashlight. Now, you may be thinking, Nick, why do you need a flashlight to take apart a knife? You don't until you drop the screw. Um, and especially if you drop it under your desk, you don't want to be able to see where that goes. Um, and sometimes it can be useful if I'm trying to peer into a little space here. Uh, you know, like, oh, what kind of washers are in here? That can be a helpful detail. Speaking of peering, um, this is the uh, this is a jeweler's loop. Um, you know, if I'm looking at a particular gem, I'm going to want to be able to zoom right in and go like, 
like, okay, oh, let's see here. Okay, jet beam, yeah. All right, the 01, yeah, there's a discontinued flashlight. Oh, that's why he hasn't made a review of it. But anyways, it's a fine little tool, and it can occasionally be useful as you are doing things. On my reviews themselves, they'll, you'll see these little kind of scales here. This one's nice because it gives inches and centimeters, so it's helping people on both sides of the, uh, well, it's helping people who use stupid units, and it's helping people who use reasonable metric ones. Um, I have myself a little scale right here that gives the uh, weight of items. I have myself a uh, set of calipers here. These are actually pretty nice calipers. Um, I also have a set of very bad calipers, um, but this can be helpful if I'm trying to do thickness comparisons, etc., as well as, you know, measuring watches and whatnot. Um, do not get into watches. And then finally, um, for sharpening purposes, a lot of folks ask, you know, Nick, what do you use to sharpen your knives? Well, um, in practice, a couple of things. I will very often use a, a strop. I have a variety of paddle straps that I will use for all of this. Um, like, for instance, I got this big guy right here, which I'm keeping with uh, three, three micron compound. This guy is also three micron. But very often, all you need to do to keep a knife super sharp is just to strop it periodically. And that's a skill that you can learn that will make you go much, much longer in between sharpenings and really help preserve the life, long-term life of your blade. So straps are a beautiful thing. And being able to use them, learn them, and, uh, you know, use them well can make you just so much better at, uh, you know, long-term maintenance. Um, then for a very brief sharpening, if I just get something in the mail that's a little bit dull, I'll often use this guy. This is the uh, Spydeco Golden Stone. It is shaped like a, just watch my review of it, but the basic idea with the Golden Stone is that you can take a knife and you can just do one of these guys with it. If you hold the knife vertical, this puts a solid angle on it. And very often, that's all it takes to get a knife back up. Oh, one more pass on this side. And again, these are skills you need to... Oh, yeah, that's freaking sharp now. Um, Anyways, this is a very, very nice uh, tool for keeping a knife that is just borderline. It's a little bit too dull to strop back to life, but it's not quite sharp, uh, dull enough to bust out the full system. Um, That can be a beautiful thing. And then finally, I use the KME sharpening system, um, which I have a full review up of when I want to do full-on sharpenings. One final thing that I wasn't able to put on the screen, but probably should have, is this little guy. This is my disassembly mat. You see this all the damn time. This has a bunch of advantages. Using something like this is very helpful. Because not only does it keep all of the alcohol and frog lube and all of the other various chemicals that you're putting out of there off of the surface that you film your reviews off uh, on, you know, that, that, that's helpful too. Um, but it also has ridges all around the outside here, which means that even if I were to open up a knife that has um, non-captive bearings, you know, thousands of little, well, not thousands, but, you know, 10 or 20 little balls in there, that will just go and roll everywhere. They can't roll very far. They'll stop here rather than rolling into the carpet and being lost forever. This is a a great thing. It also has these little pockets on the side here, which can be helpful because if I'm taking something apart, I might want to differentiate. Okay, pivot goes here. This screw goes here. This screw goes here. That way, when I'm putting the knife back together, I just look at it go, okay, this screw goes here. This screw goes here. This screw goes here. And especially when you're dealing with something with multiple layers of screws or a huge number of them, you know, something like this here, this can be helpful. You know, one, two, three, four, and etc. And it's not always the case that these screws are different, but in case it is, it's nice to have them organized as such. So that's the final piece of, you know, gear that I use on a regular basis to maintain my tools. All of these things, you know, you can pick up some, and this is a gradual process. I didn't have all of this, and my, my, my setup is continually evolving. Like I said, I tried fancy, expensive screwdrivers and realized that at the end of the day, your uh, bargain basement, you know, well, 10 bucks for a screwdriver may not be bargain basement, but it sure is compared to the 100 buck a screwdriver versions. Um, but, you know, the, these guys work just as well. You know, oh, you need something higher torque, you get something higher torque. Um, and you may see other tools show up from time to time, but by and large, those are the sets that I'm using, and uh, this is what I would recommend. If you are looking to do what I do, constantly disassembling pocket knives, it's kind of a weird life. I don't know that I recommend it specifically. But nevertheless, um, this setup that I've shown you here will get you more than ready to go and should give you everything you need to uh, have yourself a very, very happy disassembly life. So anyways, hope you found this interesting. Sorry for the length of this video, but have yourselves just an absolutely wonderful rest of your day. Bye now.